So on today's podcast, I am so excited about this uh, subject. We are going to be talking about how to launch a clothing line. And uh, my guest is Scott Brogan. Scott Brogan is my personal mentor that helped me through uh, launching ONS. And um, I'm really excited about today's show. A little bit about Scott. He started his career in the hotel industry, learning five-star service uh, with companies like Four Seasons. Um, when he transitioned out of that, he went into fashion where he partnered with Fresh Produce, a women's clothing brand, and helped launch 28 stores with that company. Then he switched his efforts into investing with brands like Island Farm, Sea Glass Lane, and most notably Outdoor Voices. His latest project is a philanthropic endeavor that combines a few of his favorite things, the ocean, rum, dogs, and giving back. Please enjoy this conversation with my mentor and great friend, Scott Brogan. All right, Scott. Well, you were telling me that you went somewhere this weekend, huh? Yeah, I had a chance to go to St. Martin's. St. Martin's. Yeah, okay. Yeah, been Dutch side. The Dutch side, the yeah, good side. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. What were you doing down there? I did a little rum research, you know, actually business. Okay. Um, we had, uh, we're starting a rum company Okay. called Sea Spot Rum. That's a and, great name. Uh, thank you. It's <laughs> S-E-A and then Spot and Rum. So we uh, went down there. There's a phenomenal distillery. Just one USA Today's top distillery uh, in the Caribbean. They make 75 different rums, flavors, and such. And we had to try all 75. 75? <laughs> yeah. How are there 75 different flavors of rum? They make, you name it, they have like a Dr. Pepper. They've got <laughs> peppermint. Gosh. They've got everything. Okay. Yeah, it's all really right. good. But they have, uh, I think it's eight commercially. Uh, the other 60-odd um, rums are available there in the distillery tour. Okay. But uh, I think it's the only product that's exported from St. Martin's. Rum is? is their rum. Oh, yeah. really? Their rum, yeah. You their know, when rums. I was there, um, gosh, it was probably three or four years ago. I remember hearing that there, that rum was the only thing that was yeah. exported off yeah. that yeah. island. Yeah. That's crazy. And of course, the hurricane last year, um, Irma hit them. I think it was the highest recorded winds in a hurricane or in a storm and the lowest barometric pressure and all those measurements, the worst storm ever recorded in the world. Really? Hit them. Directly, and, and this was last year. Obviously, this was last year, Irma. Yeah. What? So, how? How did the island look? Right. And, when you uh, looked? It, it looked way better than I thought it was going to look. Okay. And the people were um, very hardy there, and a lot of T-shirts. I survived Irma and things, but you know, they're amazing people. They're so friendly. Yeah. yeah you've been there. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, it's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. It's great. I mean, there was. We were definitely talking like there's this visible line of demarcation between the Dutch and the French. There side. is. You have like these two countries represented in this one small little island. Yeah. Exactly. And it's it's pretty crazy. But yeah, no, I th I feel like I had more fun on the Dutch side than the French side. I feel like the people were a little nicer on that. And that's really where all the uh, yachts are and the sailboats and the cruise ships and such. So they they go in on the Dutch side. Mostly Dutch. Yeah. Um, the French side is a little more laid back. Gotcha. Um, but Great Island. Uh, distillery was phenomenal. There's a guy named Topper there who uh, who's the king of rum in, in the Caribbean. And he's a character. He's 82 years old. He owns a restaurant there and the distillery. And, and uh, he, his wife started making the rum in the kitchen and bring it into the restaurant. Really? And uh, people were like, you got to start manufacturing this, you know, whatever. And so he hooked up with a couple of Americans and uh, they started the distillery. And it is phenomenal rum. USA Today's voted it the number one rum in the Caribbean. That's crazy. Yeah. Which is basically the number one rum in uh, the world. Exactly. Because yeah. rum, does rum, is rum made anywhere else other than the Caribbean? Uh, it's made in the United States as well, but... Um, it's not as good. The Caribbean is where yeah. they do it. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah. they do. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about Sea Spot Rum, because you kind of touched on it a little bit. You're yeah. you've been working on this project for the last couple, a couple of years. Couple years, yeah. It takes a while to get it going. You need a lot of rum testing. You gotta do that. Yeah. That's the um, hard part, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole idea was that we wanted to make an income and, and be a profitable company, but we wanted to make an impact. So we kind of started with uh, with dogs and we, we were sitting on a beach in Kennebunkport and they have this incredible dog beach and we're having some rum in the summer and it was just a beautiful day and we just thought you know wouldn't this be really really fun to have some kind of company that involved dogs and on the beach and then we thought you know we're drinking rum wouldn't this be I mean all three of them came yeah. together that day and we just started kicking it around for a while so this is the the brand progressed we thought, um, you know, let's give away 10% of our profits and let's figure out who we want to give it to. So we're really fortunate here in Sarasota. And one of the best companies is uh, um, Southeastern Guide Dogs. And they do an amazing job providing service dogs for veterans with PTSD and guide dogs or uh, service dogs for the visually impaired. 
And so we went over there and they were really enthusiastic about the idea of sort of co-branding and co-marketing with them. And we're planning on working with shelter dogs and a lot of other uh, companies as well. So we're pretty much helping um, companies that help dogs help people. Yeah. And that's the concept. Yeah. And it's been so rewarding. I've gone to the graduations and, and we just can't, we, we're selling merchandise already and 100% of the merchandise is going toward their- The graduations? Their so the graduations are really cool. They start with a thousand puppies and they end up sort of filtering them out a little bit. And okay. some of them, they call them, used to call them career changers where they're not quite making it, but they end up going to good homes after they've been trained. But the ones that do graduate, um, they're actually people that have sort of a match.com for dogs and disabilities. Really? And they look at the personality of the dog, look at the personality of the person, and they put them together. So after two years of training, they invite the visually impaired to live in the dorms there. And I say dorms, they're really like hotel rooms. Right. And they work with them for 21 to 28 days on, uh, you know, just training them how to use this dog and all the things, all the qualities the dog has. Wow. And uh, at the end of that time period, they have a graduation and they graduate 12 at a time. Okay. And it's just tear jerking. There's not a dry eye in the place when you see it. That's amazing. Yeah. And they provide the dogs for life. So the, the dogs tend to burn out about nine to 10 years. Okay. At that point, um, they provide another dog for free. Travel is covered, veterinarian care, all of that is covered. So it's an amazing organization. Uh, the best. I mean, that facility has to be It's like a college insane. campus. Wow. Yeah, it's, I think it's a $15 million campus. It looks like a small university. Wow. And it's just loaded with uh, employees, and your employees are allowed to bring their dogs. Of course. And uh, yeah, yeah, and if you don't have a dog, you can go down and grab one of the puppies and bring it up to keep it uh, socialized. Okay. So very it's, cool. It's it's phenomenal. So we've had a chance to go to the um, veterans graduation as well, and same thing. The yeah. guy plays the bugle at the end. Played Amazing Grace, and there's 150 people crying. Yeah. When Tommy was done, so so rewarding. I mean, it's to go to St. Martin's, drink rum, and then go to these graduations and see what you're doing for yeah. For this, just it's the best thing I've ever done. So, what's your anticipation with C Spot Rum? Are you are you planning on? Obviously, you want to create the rum. You mm-hmm. you got the recipe, so this uh, distillery is going to make the the recipe for you. Yes. And then, so you're going to go into stores, but are you shooting to go into restaurants? Like, when when are you trying to get all of this off the ground? Yeah, they call it in the in the industry on premise and off premise. On okay. premise is the bars and the restaurants, and off premise would be the large big box places and liquor stores. So we're planning on both. Um, we're also planning on having our own stores where we sell the merchandise and we um, have rum tasting, and then you can buy the bottles there. So very cool. Um, that's the way. And we're only going to do Florida. In fact, we're going to launch Southwest Florida to begin with. Okay. And then we're hoping to do Florida and do Florida really, really well. And and maybe at the point where we're busting at the seams, we'll go into some of the other states. But right. we want to be known as a Caribbean kind of Florida distribution uh, rum company. Yeah. Well, it's a good place to start. Yeah. A lot it's of rum. Number one rum uh, yeah. state in the country. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. It is. Well, that makes it sense. Is. We're yeah. so close to the Caribbean. And you personally contributed, I know. Uh, a lot. Yeah. A, yeah. Quite a lot, <laughs> for sure. Um, well, that's really exciting. I'm yeah. I'm really pumped for C Spot Rum and where that's going to go. Um, so basically, I have you on the show uh, for those for those people that don't know. Uh, Scott is is my mentor. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's been a wild ride mm-hmm. um, through starting Oak and Stone Clothing Company and and getting it off the ground. And um, so I ch- I wanted to chat with you a little bit about basically how to start a clothing line. Mm-hmm. I know that's a really really broad statement, and yeah. there's a lot of answers yeah. to that one question, yeah. but. Um, kind of wanted to give a little bit of background on our story on okay. how we met. And, um, so I had the concept for Oak and Stone, um, close to two years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, it was just, you know, in my, in my time of like trying to find clothing and going to different stores, you know, I'm just constantly telling myself like, man, why do, why do I have a, such a hard time finding clothing? Like this is, you know, it's either too tight up here and loose down here or vice versa. Yeah. And so. I was talking to Ryan, uh, my brother-in-law and he, you know, I was just like, man, I've got this concept for a clothing, clothing line. And, uh, I told him, you know, it's just, it's something that's more geared towards the athlete. You know, it just has, it keeps that athletic physique in mind and everything, but it's a lifestyle brand. It's not gym wear. Um, and he's just like, absolutely do it. And again, that was such a scary thing for him to say to me, because at that point I had never never gone into business, mm-hmm. had no idea what I was doing. Definitely hadn't had no idea how to start a clothing Which line. Which is sometimes an advantage. <laughs> you don't know all the things that lie Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like that. Ignorance like, is bliss. Exactly. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was definitely the, the, the fear of the unknown mm-hmm. for sure. Um, but after talking to a couple of people, your name came up mm. quite a bit and, um, they were like, you need to talk to Scott Brogan. And at the time you were in Maine, uh, mm-hmm. in one of your, like your vacation home up there. Mm-hmm. And, 
you know, I was just waiting for you to come back down. <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't coming back down. Well, I heard you were looking for me. Uh, is so that I what it was? There. I, yeah. you, I knew it. All the way through the winter, I, I stayed. Kn- I, knew, I knew it. <laughs> and so I just, I'm, I mean, months oh, go by. And, funny. you know, I'm just, I'm looking for you every everywhere. And um, finally, finally you're back down. I hear from uh, my father-in-law that you were back in town. And um, we were we were going on a boat trip with some mutual friends. Right. And uh, as we were walking up to the marina, I see this real tall guy standing on the boat and I'm like, who? I was like, holy shit. He's back. <laughs> it's Scott Brogan. <laughs> and it was like such a serendipitous mm-hmm. moment for me mm-hmm. because I'm like, mm-hmm. here I am looking for this guy for months. <laughs> and we just happened. I didn't even know you were going to be shows there. He shows up on a boat. At he the dock, shows up right? on a beat yeah. a boat. Like yeah. we're like, there was like eight people right. on the boat right. and you just happened to be right. one of them. Isn't that crazy? Um, and so, I immediately, like, I think we didn't even leave the marina before I started talking to you <laughs> about my concept. Um, I have, I have hyper focus. So when, when I want to, when I get something done, I'm like, all right, focus in on Scott Brogan. You waited till we got away from the dock before you started really hitting me hard. Cause I would have jumped off. <laughs> I don't blame this you. guy, right? I don't blame you. No, you're very persistent if nothing else. Right. And so, um, so we, we start talking, um, and we were on that boat for like four hours. Yeah. I don't think that we ever got off the boat and like right, interacted with right, anybody right, else. Right. Um, and I just remember leaving that conversation just incredibly charged. Mm. Um, and you were like, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I think you should do it. Yeah. Um, so basically I want to talk through those steps of like, we, after that, we had a bunch of Starbucks, uh, meetups after that. That's right. Yeah. You know, and just yeah. going through, and we probably spent what, like six months on the brand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that, that's kind of the process I want to talk about a little yeah. bit, yeah. uh, for a young entrepreneur that wants to come into the clothing business. Yeah. What's, what's the first step? Well, let me first start with my meeting with you because I do some angel consulting and I help out, as you know, um, a lot of companies get started. I particularly like your generation and I love, you know, sharing not only my hits, but mostly my misses and the things that I, uh, mistakes I made. So I always want to really emphasize those. As you know, I'm always like, no, let me share a mistake or two that I made with you in each category. But I'm always sort of looking at the person who's coming up to me with an idea and I'm, and I'm kind of looking at the idea and I've heard a lot of good ideas, but I wasn't necessarily impressed with the dedication maybe that the person had toward the idea. Right. And the one thing that came out loud and clear with Ricardo was, I will do this. Okay? <laughs> I don't care what it takes. Right. I will get this done. Yeah. And I think persistence um, and a good idea combined are or a great combination. Okay. So, so in any, any time that you're, cause you do this, I mean, this is something that I'm not your first, um, person, you know, to, to kind of in, uh, right. intern or mentor under you. Yeah. Um, yeah. so you have this kind of list of qualifications. Yeah. Do you, do you always recommend for somebody that's especially a young entrepreneur to seek a mentor out? Oh yeah. Unquestionably M- mentors, you know, mm-hmm. because, um, but, but one main guy who can be there when you're feeling down about the idea or whatever, you know, right. those seven stages of, of an idea oh, yeah. from, you know, this is great to geez, this whole thing stinks. And then all the way to it's good again. Yeah. What are the seven? You, you told me this a lot. What are the seven <laughs> stages again? Let me see if I can remember exactly. This is, this idea is awesome. This idea is really good. This idea is good. This idea sucks. I suck. <laughs> this idea is really good. This idea is awesome. Okay. And you may, you may have those seven stages in one day. Uh, I had them in like one minute yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. For plenty of times. Um, but you were, I, the one thing that just impressed me right away, I was like, you know what, this guy, he's going to finish this. He's, 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 I, I helped a, a company called Outdoor Voices get started in this. And Tyler Haney is just, you know, she's on the cover of Inc. Magazine this, this month. You reminded me of the, the male version of Tyler Haney. And that's good company. Yeah. That's no, good that's, company. But yeah. she's about the same age as you are. And that just that same drive, you know, right. and she, she went the fashion route through Parsons or whatever. And you just went through the school of hard knocks yeah. and dedication, you know, and, yeah. uh, but you're an athlete and you're built like an athlete. And so, you know what you were talking about in that area. So it was a no brainer. It was a no brainer. <laughs> well, well really, thank you. Really no. And I appreciate you taking me on because yeah. I tell people all the time, there's no way ONS would have launched mm-hmm. without yeah. without uh, Scott no, helping honor. and guiding me through that. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, so, so you have that qualification of just, <laughs> you know, who you're going to help you, you look for certain signs of, uh, am I actually investing my time? Because your time is, is an investment with, with anybody that you, that mentors under you, because yeah. I was constantly in communication with you. We were meeting yeah. Yeah. once a week, once every other week, you know, yeah. very, very consistently through the branding process. Well, and as you know, as a beginning entrepreneur, you think about it 
18 hours a day. You probably dream about it or whatever. Yeah. And so it's not just even that time, but all, it should be all encompassing. And I think one of the things when I'm meeting with somebody who's young and got an idea or whatever, is I'm like, how, how invested are you? You know, I remember what was a football coach said the difference between being committed and involved. And I think it was Vince Lombardi and Vince Lombardi said, um, a, uh, a, a chicken is involved in the egg a pig is committed to the bacon <laughs> and you had that level of commitment that uh, I could just tell. Mm, so, that's um, good. and I've worked with others where we get, you know, six, eight weeks into it, maybe even six months into it. And you just realize they're doing it part time. They haven't thrown their hat over the fence yeah. in, in essence. And, and uh, you were, you were in. So great idea, super persistent, really bright. Um, you, you walk the walk, um, perfect combination. Perfect. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about the branding process because that was, that was like our initial first step, yeah. you know, uh, outside of just, you know, talking about the concept and making yeah. sure, okay, this is a great idea. This yeah. is going to work. Yeah. Um, why did we spend so much time on the branding? So I wanted to get you focused exactly on what it was. And, and I've heard a, I've heard a good lecture where the guy said, you've got to put the big arrow on the board. Who are you? Where are you heading? Who do you want to be? And then once you've established that big arrow, you line up all the other decisions that are little arrows and you make sure they're all pointing, you know, due north. Right. And so to get the idea of the brand, why you're doing it, not just what and how or whatever, but why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. and, and where's your heart in this? And as we talked about that, I think it helped you develop some of the thoughts that you had, but maybe not even expressed. It was, it was an area that at certain moments um, in that process, I felt like, I'm wasting my time. I'm spending so much time on the branding and I'm, I don't even, I, I have no drawings yet. I have no clothing. I don't have fabrics. I don't have a manufacturer. And we spent so much time on the branding. And now obviously in hindsight, I'm like, wow, I am yeah. so happy that we did yeah. because everything is so clear yeah. from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, but in the process, it can seem a little overwhelming. Sure. Um, sure. Because you know, just put a, a cool logo and, and there's your brand. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you understood, and this is what you do really, really well, mm -hmm. is understanding that a brand is so much more than a cool logo. So much more than a cool logo. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you got it very quickly. Um, you were just like a sponge for all of that. But um, I think it was George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, one of those that said, look, give me nine hours to chop down an oak tree and I'll spend eight hours sharpening the ax. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and that's what we were doing is we're right. sharpening the ax. And if you remember when we went to New York to go to the shows, you looked already like a big company. You know, we were sitting there yeah. and we were talking to the We at least talked people. like we exactly, did. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It was a little bit of a fake facade in the For sense sure. of we weren't a huge company yet, but we were a small company that wanted, that was going to be a large company. There's a big difference, right. you know, and, and um, so we had that kind of feel. And it also, I think, gave you the confidence to walk up there and go, hey, I've got a pretty good brand here. You know, I'm, I'm not just a newcomer or whatever. I, I'm, I'm a guy walking around with a brand and an idea, and I think it's a really good idea. Yeah. And as we went to the different booths and we looked at uh, fabrics and things, and then, of course, ultimately went to the men's show um, and made great contacts there, you were walking around with a little bit more confidence than maybe the average person going in. Yeah, as we walked from booth to booth, what was uh, what was the line you kept saying? You know, uh, let me tell you what I just learned five minutes ago oh, yes, or something right, like that. Right, yeah, you know, yeah. as we... Yeah. The most terrifying moment, so to, to back up a little bit, uh, you and I went to New York after, I think it was about seven or eight months mm -hmm. in, after we had really honed in on the brand, what yeah. the brand was going to feel like, what yeah. it was going to sound like, um, we started looking for manufacturing. Right. And I told you, I have this amazing show that's going to be in New York. There's like 300, 400 plus manufacturers represented from fabric suppliers to actual manufacturers of clothing from all over the world. You're like, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's do it. And that's been like the most amazing thing as far as like you go above and beyond as a mentor. It's it's really been overwhelming because there there hasn't been a moment to where you're like, ah, Ricardo, I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not there. <laughs> like it's a big ask yeah. to ask somebody yeah. to go uh, to, to, to New yeah. York, to fly yeah. across the country to go to the show and you were absolutely oh, no hesitation. Thrill. Absolutely and thrill. so that was, it was, it was pretty amazing, yeah. you know, and, and we had a hell of a time in New York. That was, it was just you and me, but it was so fun. Yeah. You know, and we, we, we go to this, <sighs> I remember having this notebook. You remember this book that oh, my buddy Chase I do, yes, made yes, for me? A great notebook. And, yeah. It was like yeah. made out of like leather and wood yeah. and it, you know, it, it showed, it was a visual representation of the yeah. brand. And in this notebook, I had all the renderings for the designs right? and, right. um, and just the brand, like the, the mood board that you had me make, which yeah. was a big part of the, yeah. 
uh, honing in on the process right. and the brand was making this mood board of like the different color palettes that I wanted the brand right. to represent and how the clothing was going to look and how it was going to feel all represented in that mood board. So I had that whole thing. Well, and the good thing besides um, just the fabric and the drawings or whatever, a mood board is it can be inspiration anywhere. Right. You can see a painting, you can see an athlete, you can see a shot, a photograph, a photograph of someone or whatever. And those are all part of that inspiration. And, yeah. You know, yeah. I think that it's was everywhere. like one of the wor first things that you had me work yeah, on was starting, uh, starting a mood board, which I, up until that point, I never even heard of what right, a mood board was. Right. And, um, so I remember walking into this, uh, it was at the Javits center in New York city, um, which is just this huge convention center. And we walk into this, um, this convention and, look out and the, the escalators come down, you know, into this convention center. And so you just see this massive amount yeah. of booths. Yeah. And I just, I was too overwhelmed. I think we took a second before we actually we started. Did, just to take it in. Yeah. Just to take it in and just be like, all right, yeah. this is what we're here to do. Yeah. And so we go to the first booth yeah. and I just kind of watch you and we kind of interacted and you just kind of sat back and, and I was, we, we learned so much in the first booth. We did. We did. We learned a we lot learned in the first lot. booth. Said, just in, interacting with the the manufacturer of the, I think it was a fabric supplier. It was. And um, then we went to the next booth. Right. And, right. and took all the things we knew from the first booth. And exactly. Like exactly. Right, right, right. And it was, I mean, gosh, yeah. we, we went through hundreds of booths. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we originally went there, we were looking for U.S. manufacturing. I don't know if you remember that right. or not. That's right. Because our goal was to have Oak and Stone made here. Yeah. Um, and first of all, there was no U S manufacturing yeah, represented a handful and they weren't in the category that we were looking for. Exactly. Yeah, I think yeah. they were a, a couple of like fabric suppliers, yeah. but as far as like yeah. actual manufacturers of the clothing, we couldn't, yeah. they, none of be, it used to be a day in the United States where they're all over, but it's really dwindled. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so I know we were a little frustrated with that and just, we weren't really connecting with any of the manufacturers on a real deep level. Right. And this was one of the big things that you taught me. Um, in the process of finding a manufacturer is that you are going into business with this manufacturer. Mm -hmm. They are creating your product. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very, very big thing and you do not take this lightly. Yeah. And so I, that kept re <laughs> recycling through my head the whole yeah. time. I'm like, I'm not connecting with this representative from this manufacturer. Yeah. And um, not everybody does business that way, but I did it. And then I was trying to impart upon you, but I think naturally you did it as well as I, I really want to like you, right. you know, because yeah. I'm going to be spending a lot of time with you. Let's right. make sure we like each other, you right. know, and not everybody does it that way. And particularly in the garment industry, it can be pretty cutthroat. But um, I think when you start again, big arrow is I really want to like who we're working with. It kind of directed in the, in the right spot. And you've had some, I mean, this was lessons learned in your, your career. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, yeah. this was something that you've gone through. So yeah. you're like, you know, this is kind of one of the things that you really want to yeah. Oh, yeah. look out yeah. for. In, in the distillery, we, uh, we interviewed, I mean, just, we just you went were, around yeah. the distillery after distillery and right. I was driving my, my mentor in the business um, crazy. <laughs> and he's like, we don't have to like this guy. He's just making rum for us. Yeah. Go, no, no, you don't have to like him. I have to yeah. like him. And it's just an important part of it. You yeah. know? Cause you and, found one guy that you were impressed with his rum, but you just didn't connect with him. No, return he didn't return calls. And then he was, you know, kind of gruff or whatever. And yeah. I'm like, you know what, if I'm going to be on the phone every day with this guy, it's, it's not the way the, the the person I want to be with. So yeah. consequently, the people I found are like family that we were all uh, talking about how much we're going to miss each other at the end of this trip and, you know, come on back. <laughs> After only spending again. like two or three days <laughs> exactly. with each other. Exactly. Teary eyed. Yeah. You know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And I was just like, ah, oh, I'm so glad I waited. Yeah. But the big arrow was one of those things was I got to like the people that I'm working with. Right. I mean, it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. And, it, yeah. and I think it worked for you. Well, and I'm so glad that we did that because I remember leaving the convention center after two days of walking the floor. And, um, I had this probably like small handful of business cards mm -hmm. and, you know, we had talked to a guy out of Egypt, mm -hmm. um, a couple of Chinese Hong Kong manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, it was funny because we went to this one, uh, booth. I don't know if you remember this, but there was all younger, um, I believe they were, uh, Japanese, um, younger guys that were okay. there. And when I pulled out the book, they were like, Oh my gosh, they were like <laughs> body over the book. And yeah, so yeah. that was probably one yeah. of the ones that I was leaning towards yeah. because they were, they were younger, right. you I know, remember, yeah. yeah, they had a yeah. good vibe about them, yeah. but it was still not like, there was this huge language barrier yeah. between, yeah. um, and that was really where I was falling yeah. a little short on that. And so we're leaving the Javits center and we're, we're walking through the convention hall and we noticed that there's like a, a menswear 
convention going on at the same time as this manufacturing convention. And so this menswear convention was all of these younger, smaller um, boutique brands mm -hmm. that were representing them themselves to wholesalers. Right. And so we go up to the desk and, and you just throw your card on the, on the table. Well, you had to be a retailer. To you go had in to be there, a retailer. You, you were, were none of those. No. Yeah. I just happened to be and yeah. have my cards with me and yeah. my, my business ID number and yeah. stuff. So yeah, we just, just, and we barely saw the sign on the, in the corner of our it eye. It was, yeah, it, because yeah, it, was it was in the corner. And yeah. I think, you know, yeah. yeah. So that was just pure, pure luck happenstance. But you know what? It's unbelievable. Business has those moments right. where, you know, we could have walked by there and been talking and, and, missed and it, it. would have been totally different. Yeah. 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 So we, we go up to this convention and uh, I remember getting, first of all, it had a completely different vibe from the manufacturing convention because yeah. the manufacturing convention was pretty stark. Yeah. It was uh, not very well designed. You know, the, the booths were just had a bunch of fabrics. Very but utilitarian. Like very utilitarian. Are, you know, and everyone exactly. looked the same. Yeah. You know. um, but this was like almost walking through a, a mini store. Mm -hmm. You know, these, yeah. a lot of these brands from Frank and Oak, um, a lot of these smaller, you know, smaller to medium size uh, menswear brands were represented. Right. And um, the connections we made there, were unbelievable. They were. You know, and so we're, we're walking along and we, we come across this brand called Bridge and Burn. Um, and and the, the owner and founder of it just happened to be at the, at the booth. Yeah. And we, I think we were both like automatically drawn to it because it had a very similar vibe and brand to did. Oak and Stone. Did. And so we were, we were kind of looking through the, the stuff and Eric starts talking to me and, and we just hit it off right away. Yeah. And, um, he was just like, that was loud. Um, so he was just like, I've got this great manufacturer yeah. and in this world, in the fashion world, it's kind of taboo to tell, yeah. tell your secrets. Yeah. And he was so willing to help he was. me as a young entrepreneur he that was. was coming into this industry. Yeah. He set me up with his manufacturer, uh, which was this great boutique manufacturer out of Hong Kong that he had nothing but good things to say about them. They had a representative in Vancouver, which put the time zone thing in a really great spot you know, spot because that right. was always an issue too. Right. Um, you know, if I'm having to deal with somebody in China, there's a 12 hour difference. Mm -hmm. So having that liaison in Canada that was only four hours behind mm -hmm. as opposed to 12 hours yeah. was a really nice connection yeah. to have. And a great recommendation already. He'd worked with them for several years. Well, and he was, yeah, you know, he exactly. Beat that. Yeah. Exactly. And, and we had the, the items in front of us. Yeah. We saw the product that they made and we were, we had nothing but good things to say. Yeah. So I knew I had the security of like from the designers and that he validated them. Yeah. And, and let's just give a shout out to him because yeah, that's, my goodness, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. he, he couldn't have been any more cooperative. Yeah. And, that's a uh, bridge and burn out of Portland, Oregon. There you they, go. They're shout a great out. shop. Yeah. Look them up online. Or and, what? um, but yeah, they, it, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, it, it, it was one of those things that it, it felt like, okay, you're, you're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. these doors seem to be opening and, yeah. and from there, you know, it was just about getting the, uh, tech packs, to uh, to the manufacturer, um, getting the introductions right, getting the fabrics sourced properly, and he helped me with the the fabric sourcing right. because he used a, a couple of different manufacturers for that that end, and it was. Um, Tell me about your tech pack experience. So, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, a tech pack is basically a blueprint for clothing, <laughs> and so basically it's um, you have the renderings of the design. And you have, but depending on the design, there's anywhere from 20 to 25 points of measurement on this blueprint. And so, you know, you're, you're measuring from here to here, here to here. You and know? for you, here to here was different. Exactly. Than what's the standard. Exactly. You know? um, so as I'm, you know, doing my research into how, how do I do this? Because I, I found a manufacturer and had no idea how to actually get them my, my clothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I tell you what to make? Um, so the, Google was a great, great yeah, source. Yeah. Uh, not only just you, but there was a lot of times that I'm just like, I can't, I can't ask Scott Rogan a question <laughs> that I can, that can be answered on Google on YouTube, you know? So that was a big thing for me. Uh, I think Tim Ferriss tells that, yes, says that a lot, yes, right. you know, to value yeah. you, um, your mentor, yeah. make sure that you're not asking them something that could be Jesus easily like, Googled. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so that was always, and then when you would Google things, you'd come up with three or four different options and then we would talk exactly and had it in front of you. Exactly. Yeah, but, yeah. So that way we weren't just looking, right. you know, going in blind or anything, but, um, and did you see a tech pack book? Yeah. <laughs> so in my research for trying to figure out how to like actually create a tech pack, um, I was on YouTube and, and one of the things that, um, 
I saw, I kept seeing in the background of these videos, this one book, it looked exactly the same in all the, in all of them. And so what I did was on one of the videos, it was pretty clear. I just zoomed in real, real tight. <laughs> and it was this book on, it was basically the Bible for tech pack right. design. And I found it on Amazon and ordered it. It was like a hundred and something dollars, but it was either that or hire a designer to actually create the tech packs for right, me, right. which we were actually exploring that yeah. route as well, because yeah. I had no design experience yeah. at all. Yeah. And so as a, as a new startup, as a lean, lean, lean startup that I'm, I'm funding lean is, uh, yeah. Yeah, is an understatement. Yeah. Of, uh, no, yes, that I'm yeah. funding through yeah. this whole process. Yeah. Um, I didn't have you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars to pay a designer just to create the tech packs. And so um, I remember looking through that book and I just was blown away because it was a step by step, you know, process of how to create a tech pack. And it had templates, it had everything in it. And so, you know, I had um, I knew what I wanted as far as like the measurements and stuff like that and just started creating a tech pack. And actually Eric um, from Bridge and Burn sent me one of his tech mm-hmm. pack templates, mm-hmm. which another another amazing thing um, from his side. There is, will be a day where you pay this forward. For I, sure. I know that you will be helping out all yeah, these, yes. Absolutely. Yes. I think you've launched already a thousand clothing companies because of the things you're saying and the things you're gonna do going yeah. forward and helping so many people. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the people that have helped me in, yeah. in this process has yeah. just been so eye-opening. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, he sent me his template. And so I used that as far as like knowing how the layout of the, te- the tech pack and I, I kind of, and I made it my own and, mm-hmm. you know, had my own measurements, my own designs and, um, you know, spent hours and hours and hours fine tuning these measurements to where I, I thought that they needed to be. Right. And um, at that point we, we were corresponding with the, the manufacturer. Um, and this was kind of a, an area that you were, you were like, because you hadn't manufactured clothing. You've been in the fashion industry, but you have been... Well, we had staff that did that. You, so exactly. I was aware of the process, exactly. but I never actually dug into it. Yeah. And the great part about you, I mean, when we first opened up the stores, I'd have that clothes delivered to my house and I'd be sitting there pricing everything yeah. and then putting it in storage and then taking it to the store. So right. I had a ground level experience and I was the buyer, the accounting and everything. But the actual design in our company, we had people that did it. They went to, to Parsons or whatever for right. four years and you, you were you were everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're like that commercial where it's shipping, yeah, accounting, yeah, you know, answering the phone to for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, um, it was you, you were a great resource in the sense that you, you had given me ideas as far as okay, there, here's a connection for this one designer that I have that could, you could possibly work with that she would create the tech packs and the, the walking me through that step. Mm-hmm. But as far as like the nuts and bolts of it, I was just like, oh, I gotta figure out how to do this because yeah. it's just too much money. Yeah, and you save yourself thousands and thousands of dollars by doing yeah, it. Yeah, $100, $100 yeah. for a book and, yeah. and just yeah. did it. And, um, you know, so at this point I'm corresponding with the manufacturer and um, this was a, a long process, mm-hmm. as you know, mm-hmm. and this was a painful process mm-hmm. because I think it took about a year. Yeah. And it's long and painful in the beginning, but once you get it down, then yeah. you know. I mean, you can go through a tech pack now and do it in, in yeah. no time compared to the first time. So for yeah, sure. you've sort of laid that groundwork for, mm-hmm. for for future business. Do you remember that time of that interim of just <clears throat> like going back and forth? I mean, months were going by between samples. Yeah, I remember. I remember samples coming in and you were like, no, half inch there. I mean, you're very meticulous about it. It's one of the things I thought was great. I think um, when I go into your office, there's a little OCD there in the sense of the way everything's stacked. And <laughs> But you need to have that. Early. And if you're not, hire somebody who is right. because um, you can't afford to have these mistakes. And, and I remember sample after sample coming in and you're like, okay, close, close, but we got to go back. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, you know, at the time I felt like, you know, am I just being too meticulous with it? Yeah. I don't know what that is. Um, Am I being too meticulous with it? And it was, I mean, I I have other friends that are entrepreneurs that they're just like, you know, pushing me like, exactly what's going on, what's going on. So anyway, I remember at that point, um, our, during that time, it, our sessions at Starbucks became more like counseling sessions right, right, right. than, um, 
actually talking about. And you've got to have that. I mean, I sit in a men's lunch group, as you know, and one guy's in sod, another guy's a builder or whatever, but we have the shared experience and mm-hmm. we, we can talk about staffing and production and, and a customer response or whatever it might be, but it's so great to have these kind of people around. doesn't matter what business. There's yeah. a lot of commonalities between sod and women's clothing or right. men's clothing. You yeah. know, it's just, yeah, it's just business. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so that process that year, um, it was a, it was a painful year of just trying to uh, just feeling this pressure of like, I need to get this yeah. clothing line off the ground. Um, and being frustrated in between the samples coming in and, yeah. um, you know, I just felt so ready to go for so long. And, and when you're a small guy, you're down at the bottom of the list of these manufacturers. So right. I think I remember a couple of these guys had huge, huge orders to fill and right. they fit you in between. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. but they, but they recognize the talent as well when they were, you know, you were fortunate to get fit in there like that, but yeah, yeah you're, you're at the bottom of the list, yeah. you know, they're taking care of the tens of thousands of orders. I remember you, know, you trying yeah. to make me feel better by saying that. And I'm like, that's not helping. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk through a little bit of the, uh, about that time, um, because I think, um, what were some of the things that you were kind of talking through with me uh, in that, in that time, as far as I'm trying to remember, and it was some, it was a time that I was like, just trying to X out of my life because I had so many other things going on in life, you you know, and this was uh, getting this clothing brand off the ground was, was something I was doing in my spare time. Yeah. And uh, so burnout was a huge thing. Um, well, nobody fits in more activities in the course of a day than you do. I mean, you're up at yeah. what, 430 in the morning and you're going to work out at the gym. Not as not out. as early anymore. Let me clarify <laughs> yeah. that. So that way it's, it's but five at that o'clock. time, at that yeah. time, yeah. you were going in seven days a week and you're working out and then you're coming home and you're getting breakfast and you're going to a regular job. You've got two daughters, you've got a wife, yeah. you come home, you go food shopping at the end of your regular day, then you, and you're cooking a meal for everybody and yeah. doing that. And then you're being a dad and you get bedtime and then Oak and Stone. Right. But you dedicated a lot of time to Oak and Stone. You know, right. it wasn't really an afterthought. I mean, you you could tell you were really into it, but yeah. um, trying to fit all of that in at the same time was uh, an amazing process. I but, think that's why our, our sessions were so much more like a counseling session. Right. It was just, right, right. and that's another thing I want to hit on with any yeah. sort of like business. Um, and you've experienced this, I've experienced this, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs yeah. experience this. Yeah. It's this overwhelming yeah. um, feeling. Yeah. There's got to be a part, uh, at least for me, that I have to put it in a compartment. And, you know, I, I, I'm a dad, you know, and you've got marriage going on, you've got jobs, you've got all the other social pressures or whatever. And you can drive yourself crazy if you're not able to compartmentalize this and say, OK, I'll come back to that. And, yeah. and I think worry, one of my favorite expressions is worry is just a horrible misuse of imagination. <laughs> and so if you've got yeah. something creative you can be imagining things and, it, and, it's, and it's geared towards the creativity than it is the worry. Yeah. But there's always that side to it. Am I going to get in in time? Am I gonna, and you got people pressuring you to um, tons of deadlines and things, but you handle it extraordinarily well. And I think that's part of being an athlete and the dedication you have in working out is that um, you, you've got that self-discipline. Yeah. And um, it's, one, it's one of your greatest attributes. And thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you all. Full yeah. of all kinds of compliments today. I like this podcast. It's a good one. Um, so we finally, uh, I remember the big day of finally receiving the final product. Yeah. Uh, we t- we yeah. took some pictures and stuff like that and um, sent you photos and, yeah. and it was, it was yeah, unbelievable. It was um, and I remember one of the, one of the first things that you told me uh, in our meetings was you were so excited for me to receive my first piece of clothing mm-hmm. with my brand on it yeah. and, you know, open yeah. it up and put it on. Yeah. And so that whole time I'm looking through those boxes, I'm just thinking Scott Rogan, what you said. <laughs> and I just, it was kind of like when like a runner that, um, envisions the finish line, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's a lot of runners that I've, I've heard like these long distance runners, all they'll do is one of the things that they'll do is they'll go see the end of the race mm-hmm. and they'll and they'll see that finish line and that's what they focus on the whole time. Right, right. And for me, through this whole thing, it was a marathon. Mm-hmm. It was two years of hard work, dedication, over time, making sure that I'm not um, neglecting my family and my girls because I wanted to make sure that they felt prioritized yeah. in anything that I did. And which, by the way, my wife has been amazing. She has. Through this whole she process, has. as you know, yeah. like... Yeah. You know, the, as a married man to have a wife that supports you yeah. as much as she has priceless. through this whole She's thing, yeah. I mean, my different trips to New York and LA and all the time, money, 
dedication, she's been right there with me the yeah. whole time, which yeah. has been unbelievable. Yeah. And I know you, you expressed your just amaze and well, awe. With my employees, the first thing we do like at a, a Christmas party or, or an office party or whatever is the first people I thank is spouses, yeah. and girlfriends, whatever, whoever the significant other is in that family because it, it requires that. Yeah. And, and retail and manufacturing and clothing has got all kinds of odd hours. Right. And uh, yeah, so Laura, shout out to yeah. Laura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, so so back to the, the clothing though, it was, that's what I kept envisioning. Yeah. From the day you told me that, I was like, you're gonna go through all this pain, effort, time, money. And a very delayed gratification. Super format, delayed. Delayed gratification. Yeah. Marathon's a really good analogy. Another one I always use is a hurdler. And in, in hurdling, you don't look at the hurdle. You're looking at the finish line and the hurdle just happens to be in the way, but the head always has to stay up and look, you know, yeah. and, and it's that kind of thing because obstacles come at you left and right, like a video game. Right. And you just got to keep down, but you know what that final thing yeah. is going to look like. And then when you actually get the product, then you're looking forward to, okay, now the next thing I see, this is the next, you know, and, and goals are measurable, achievable, and progressive. Right. And they have to be progressive. Right. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was the thing for me. Yeah. It was that, that envision, envisioning that opening that box, yeah. you know, and, and seeing, seeing the final product yeah. after two years of just painstakingly trying to figure this <laughs> whole thing out. It was finally here. I had product yeah. and that, that was an amazing yeah. moment. And, yeah. you know, after that, you know, it was setting up the website, the easy stuff, you know, yeah. the stuff that was more in my yeah, wheelhouse, exactly. you know, setting exactly. up the website, photography, video, the more creative end, which I, I enjoyed every step of this process, yeah. by the way. It, it, I never would have thought I would have been in clothing yeah. my whole life. Yeah. Um, and it was, it's been an amazing industry. Yeah. Like I, th I think uh, it's really opened my eyes to yeah. something that I really, really love. Yeah. Um, and I'm so excited to move forward with it all. Uh, well, and every business has the things that we really, really love to do and has the things we don't. And, you know, every business has a lower Siberia <laughs> that you don't want to go in there and you don't want to do. Right. And fortunately, as you get a little bigger, you can hire people that really actually like to do that. Yeah. Um, I heard the analogy once of a, of a, a lion and, and a lion, the, the major food that it gets is antelope. That's what provides for the calories. Um, preferably an injured antelope because in the in the wild it's all about calories in calories out right. so if you've got an injured antelope you've got 10,000 calories and you only spend 200 getting going after it so you always want to remember in business who that antelope is and that's the, the thing but the the lion's favorite meal is field mice and they love field mice that's like truffles to them really? but it costs them a thousand calories chasing that thing around and the field mice might be you know uh, 200 calories right so you always have to you know concentrate on on the on the antelope and then fool around with the field mice right and and so you've got certain areas that you love doing yeah. and others you don't and that's yeah. typical of an entrepreneur yeah no there's definitely like i i i obviously love the the photography side the video side the creativity side and just designing all of that i, I work with ryan parker really closely yeah, yeah. and he's just an amazing um he's the graphic designer for open stone yeah. he, he created the brand yeah. um he creates a lot of the aesthetic of the yeah. website and, the, and it's a beautiful aesthetic i mean mm -hmm. you really you've really done a great job on that well thank you that's yeah. a lot of ryan parker yeah he's, shout out to ryan yeah shout out to ryan for a sure lot of people here yeah exactly and um that's a big thing too is just there's so many people give me credit for getting Oak and Stone off yeah. the ground, but yeah. there's been so many people that have made that happen. Yeah. And um, we've well, heard the expression where you're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? You know, people that launch you, previous designers, whatever the inspiration was, and right. all the people that support you, and you've been great about uh, acknowledging them all the way through. Yeah, people are very excited to work with you. Yeah, no, it's and it's and it's exciting to work with the people that I've had yeah. the honor of working yeah. with. Um, so I wanted uh, to talk a little bit about you. Um, now that we've gone through the story of Oak and Stone, like, um, how did you get into fashion? Because I know your background. Yes, you right, know you have right, a right. you have a dad that was a FBI. Uh, he was actually a detective, detective, yes, a captain of detectives in New Jersey, and, and my uh, brother as well as yeah, a detective. Yeah, yeah, so I come from a law enforcement family. My mom worked for a judge. My cousin was the sheriff. You know, so we I pretty much had everybody through parole. Right. You know, and the, um, but uh, I went to grad. I, I went to undergraduate school, criminal justice. Thought maybe I'd be a U.S. attorney or FBI or something like that, and it turned out to be affirmative action back in the '70s. So wasn't going to happen. Then I went to graduate school and exercise physiology and nutrition mm -hmm. and got my gra uh, graduate degree in that. I ended up working with um, uh, hotel industry, some uh, five-star hotels. 
and open up properties or whatever. And then I came to Sarasota to help. I started a consulting company and came here and helped a, a, a place out. And just a, another guy in the hotel world called me and he said, hey, we're looking for a tennis pro or, you know, you think you can uh, can find somebody for us? And I'm like, yeah, I just happen to have a guy in mind. We recommended him. They hired him. There was a shop there and, and they, they just needed suntan lotion and those kind of things. And and uh, the pro said, I don't have any money. Do you want to do you want the shop? And so we worked out a deal where I gave him a percentage of the, the sales. So I'm like, I have no idea where to get suntan lotion from or clothing or any of that. Where do you go? Yeah. And uh, somebody said, hey, there's a show in Orlando twice a year. And so I uh, I head out and I look at it. And the first booth I happen to walk in is this company called Fresh Produce. And I'm like, well, this stuff looks pretty good. And next thing I know, I bought like half of my budget on the first booth that I walked <laughs> into. And I had the worst buyer's remorse <laughs> later on. Uh, anyway, we put their, their things in our store and it did really, really well. And I get a letter, uh, probably a year later from Fresh Produce saying, Hey, you know, to send it out to their six or 800 accounts that they had, um, are you guys interested in doing a store with all of our product and, you know, no franchise fee, no anything, you know, we'll just license it to you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sounds like a great idea. So I run down to this really exclusive shopping center that we have St. Armand Circle in Sarasota. And I signed a five-year lease at, you know, ridiculous amount of money, you know, five, six thousand dollars a right. month. And uh, I'm in business, you know, talk about throwing your hat over. So um, so I do it and I and I kind of call Fresh Produce back and I go, hey, I, I just got a place or whatever. How, how many other people signed up for this deal? And they go, oh, you're the only one. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so out of 800 accounts, what did I, you know? Yeah. Um, but it turned out to be a great investment. I ended up um, working with them for 25 years, became a partner. Right. Um, in the company and then just sold in uh, 2012. But uh, it was happenstance, completely happened. No intention whatsoever being in the clothing business. Yeah, and I remember when I found out that you had been a partner at Fresh Produce, I had seen the brand all over the place. I yeah. mean, anywhere from yeah. Disney World to Universal. Yeah, we had 28 of our own stores plus uh, 800 accounts, Nordstrom's, Macy's, you know, we were, we were pretty well known. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I always had this, you know, this legend of Scott Brogan with Fresh Produce, uh, you know, kind of in the back of my head, um, you know, and it, 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 I had a lot of respect for you yeah, in that time. Yeah. Um, but since then, you've you've opened another uh, few stores. Yeah. So I um, created and invested in um, a few different businesses. Um, there's a store called Island Farm out in Boulder, Colorado, right on Pearl Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always thought that we liked the anthropology a lot. And, you know, being in the women's clothing for a long time, we were looking for niches, you know, where was, maybe some holes were. And so we always thought anthropology was just a great product, uh, beautifully um, designed, and sort of just when you walked in, you, know, you just admired all the merchandising and things. But it, we felt like at that woman, at, up to about 35, 38, they started to lose her, that there was still that happening woman who, you know, Chico's is a great company, but to go from anthropology to Chico's is quite a jump, you know? So we thought maybe there's something else. And so we thought maybe 35 to 55 would be that, that sort of the bell curve of a customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we opened it up and just gangbusters. It's going yeah. incredibly well. And we're finding the age group. It's going up to 80 and all the way down to, you know, the teens. Right. Um, but it has sort of an American feel versus the French feel. But it's four or 5,000 um, square feet, historic 150-year-old building. Yeah. And um, it's, it's gone extremely well. And then we took a cousin of that and it made a sort of a beach store a lot of the same product or whatever, but moved it. Um, and then it's opened up in Sanibel called Sea Glass Lane. Yeah. And it was the same thing. It was like, okay, but it's flowy kind of bohemian look. And we felt that there was a, there was a market for that in the, in the Florida market to begin with. And we opened that up a couple of years ago, just uh, tripled the size last year. And wow. the same thing, just uh, it's going gangbusters. So yeah. we're really, really fortunate. So it seems to be a, a really important thing, especially to set yourself apart in any sort of fashion industry is to yeah. find a niche, yeah. you know, that that's, you know, that's what I did with Oak and Stone. That's what you've done with your brands yeah. as far as, you know, you're talking about finding this gap yeah. where it's yeah. not being filled by it. Well, and the two things I always think an entrepreneur has is they, they, they say, hey, I, I think there's a need here. Mm -hmm. But the second part is I'm the one to do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's where it separates the men from the boys, right. you know, and it was like, and you, you, you right away were like, yeah, no, I'm, tr I'm not getting this fit or whatever. Now, most people, um, they're not entrepreneurial, which is most would go out and I'll find somebody that does it. I'll look even harder in Google. And you're like, no, no, 
I'm the man to fill this niche. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't say that at first. <laughs> I was like, I think I could do it. <laughs> um, that was ultimately, a, ultimately, yes. um, lot of, lot of, <laughs> a lot of self doubt. Yeah, a lot of self doubt. Yeah. Well, and I think everybody that's an entrepreneur, I think everybody in general has this this fear that Toto's going to come along and pull back the curtain on oh, you and sure. go, you don't know what you're doing. For sure. <laughs> you know? Ignore that man behind the curtain. You know, um, that that, uh, that I have that constant fear yeah, all, all yeah. the time that but, people are going to find out. Well, they're going to find out now yeah. if they watch this podcast <laughs> that I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, uh, but I've got great support. That's kind of helped me through, yeah. the, well, through the process. And one of the great things about our relationship has been, I'm always telling you, I don't know what I'm doing either. You know, this is work this through, you know, just the honesty I, of yeah, it all. Exactly. Just figured it out. I said, I'd much rather share my blooper reel with you than my highlight right, reel. Right. And I've got lots of bloopers, you yeah. know, but, um, the authentic part of it, you know, you, you want your brand to be authentic. You want to be authentic as a person as you grow. And, um, I think that's, uh, it sort of humbles you to begin with because right. you don't think you're all that great no matter what the success that you've had. Um, and you just realize you're only one blooper away again from another stupid thing that you've done. You right. know? So yeah, but that makes it fun. One of the things I've really found about you is that you are a branding master. <laughs> like it's, it's unbelievable. The things that come out of your mouth as far as like certain brands and titles for name, uh, like for, yeah, for different funny. brands, yeah, like, yeah. Have you always been that talented in coming up with branding? I think I have. I okay. can remember my mom and dad would take me to this flea market kind of place in, uh, in southern New Jersey where I grew up. And there was this giant warehouse. And the warehouse had sayings all the way around it. And I would get my parents to stop me at that place so that we could drive slowly around and bless them you right. know, for, for doing this. But I would, I'd sit there and I'd read out loud what the sayings were and the modest. So I've always been kind of a wordsmith that way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we were, uh, syndicated comic strip, uh, writers and things for a lot of different comic strips as well as editorial cartoons. So wordsmithing, um, humor, those kind of things, yeah. um, probably come naturally. You don't really recognize it necessarily as a natural talent until maybe other people tell you because yeah. you think everybody thinks the way you do. You know? Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, unfortunately and unfortunately I looked at the world through that kind of thing and I can't turn it off, but right. it's entertaining for me because yeah. me lots of, uh, mental exercises. Right. Yeah. And so taking a step back, um, cause I really, I, I'm a, I like to pull things into, a, an edible, mm -hmm. um, if you were to, if I were to sit down with you again as a young entrepreneur and we were just to go through the steps of how, what it would take to actually start a clothing line. If we can concise that down to a few steps, mm. what would be those mm. those few steps that you yeah. would think that would be the biggest thing? These are sure. the largest hurdles that you're going to have to get through sure. before you can actually start the yeah. brand. So the number one thing is to find a niche. Got to do that, right? And and describe why you know where, where you know, the book Guerrilla Marketing talks about you know where you're looking at a big company. Guerrilla fighters can't go head to head with a big company or big big army. So what they look for is the weak flank. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for that weak flank and then that's when they, they, they come in. And so you're up against some huge clothing companies, thousands of them. And you have to find out, all right, where's their weak flank? Where do we want to go in? So it all starts with that idea to begin with. Um, then I think uh, you, you sort of just got to chew on it for a while. You mm -hmm. know, they, they, they talk about a really good idea is kind of like a cow producing milk. You know, you don't, you don't just start producing milk. You got to chew a lot of grass in the field for a while. Right. And it doesn't look anything like milk production. Right. But you've got to do that. And so that's what I was kind of encouraging you to do. And just to make sure you really wanted to make the leap. Um, but I think what separates the person who's thinking about it from, you know, I, you don't want to die an old man with a good idea. No. You want to, if you have a good idea, then dang it, follow it, you know, yeah. come through on it. And um, I think, uh, so um, courage isn't the absence of fear. Mm -hmm. Courage is facing the fear and do it in any way. Right. Right. So I think that's what stops. Because every time I talk about what I do for a living, and I'm sure you get it too, you're like, oh, I have this idea. And I'm like, well come on, do it. Why aren't you doing it? You know? So you were really smart. I think that to, to come up with that idea, you live it. Um, and you saw that there was a, there was a gap. And then you said, yeah, but I don't know all this. So what, who can I go to and who can I bounce things off? So I think that's a phenomenal step is to get somebody to encourage you. And it could be people in the business. It could be people in another business that are entrepreneurial, but to, and you didn't hang around necessarily an entrepreneurial family or whatever. You, no. you got inspired um, internally yeah. and then you looked for external. Yeah, no, I mean, both my parents were company people. Like yeah. my dad, you know, my whole life was like, you know, you find a good job with a good company and stay there for 40 years. And so that was my mindset. And yeah. it's actually my, 
I, I give him, my brother-in-law a lot of credit for instilling yeah. a, more of an, the entrepreneurial yeah. Um, idea. Yeah, no, he's, and, and he's, he's because he's a, I mean, serial entrepreneur. He like he's he very, very active in that world. Yeah. And um, that was the first time I had even had the idea of being able to start right. like a, right. a, a business because yeah. that had not been introduced to me yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. I, I think that's incredibly important. And then have some role models, whether in the business or not in the business. And, um, you know, I've always, uh, I've just always admired people that are, you know, interrupters that just start something and just change the whole business. You know, I remember Oprah Winfrey was in, interviewing James Cameron and when he came out with Avatar and she just said, you know, I thought I was doing really, really well you've inspired me to take it up 10 more notches right. or whatever, you know, and we, we should always have those kind of people, yeah. you know, that are doing it. And I just came back, you know, from St. Martin and, and this, um, this, uh, the man that I was working with is a, is a legend on the Island. And I was like, man, you've inspired me. I got to get going here. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing anything compared to what you're doing, you yeah. know, and just the way he embraced people and, and how many people just loved him for who he was and what yeah. he had done. You know? So it's really important who you surround yourself with is basically uh, what you're unquestionably, saying. Unquestionably, unquestionably. Yeah. So, um, you know, study after study shows that when you're a teenager, it's who you hang around with, who your five best friends are is going to determine a lot of your success. And I think it's the same thing in business and, and, uh, to be curious, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, these are broad things, but you you know, I interview a lot of people where I talk when they come to me and or whatever, and they're not curious. They're just telling me all the things they know or whatever. And they're not really looking to pick my brain as much as get validation maybe for a good idea. Right. And I think the one, one of the things that impressed me the most about you was you're just curious. You just like, tell me everything, you know, come on, let's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my pen and paper. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, like I said, I really enjoyed sharing the mistakes because I think it makes, um, maybe a mentor more human or whatever to say, Hey, look, man, I screwed this up. Every insecurity you've got about doing this, I had to, as well. And, and not only that, but you know, success is not a straight arrow up, right. you know, it's that little curly lines that generally works its way up. But, right. um, I think that, I think that's probably my favorite thing to do with young entrepreneurs is share the failures Yeah, and then you can fail your way to success. Yeah. I feel like that's what I've done a lot of. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Still doing it every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. So step one, find a concept, find a niche, find something that the, the market is currently not satisfying. Right, right. Step two, do your research. Do your research. Yeah. Check it out. What, what are they doing? There may be some companies that you don't know about that are doing this already, right. you know, so you got to make sure you've, you know, flushed them all out. Yeah. And that was a big um, thing that you had me do in the beginning was like, yeah. find out clothing yeah. companies that are starting to get into this yeah. and find out who your competitors are. Right. Right. Uh, the guys from Warby Parker, um, who I really admire what they're doing with the, with the eyeglasses. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is they started with another company and they said, you know what? I think there's a better way to do it than with the way these guys are doing it. They also had that compassionate side where they're giving a pair away for the, you know, the buy one, give one I love. Um, and then it was four guys and they, you know, they got going, but what, um, what they said was they were asking the interview question, you know, do you fear going up against these big guys or whatever? And going like, no, no, we got this covered. What we fear is four other guys in a garage somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and that's exactly, um, yeah. you know, we had anthropology coming in and looking at our store and I was like, all right, we're on the, you yeah. know, the market because they're fearing that boutique that those guys coming out with some really fresh new ideas. They're not right. fearing Gap or somebody else. They already know who they are. Right. Um, so I love garage based businesses, yeah. you know, um, and, and that's who you were. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the idea is to check out everybody who else, you know, who's doing it. Um, and then research, 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 you know, yeah. find out everything you can. And I think you did it in a perfect way because you researched and then you got to a point where look, Hey, I got all this information, but Scott, help me yeah. uh, put it in some kind of, uh, right. you know, organized fashion. What should right. I throw out? What should I keep? Because discernment is so important because right. stuff comes at you. Information comes at you um, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, and then, so you have to kind of sort through that. Right. But, um, I got you to focus. It took a while. I got you to focus in on exactly who you wanted to be. Right. We looked at the competition. Um, we looked for some holes where we could fit in. Right. Um, we looked at a marketing strategy. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs in the beginning fear not having any money or experience. Mm -hmm. It's probably the number one fear is like, or where do I come up with this? And I can guarantee you there's more money out there than there is really good ideas. 
and that sort of overcomes that. And I said, let's not worry about that right now. Remember I kept saying, you know, when you- Well, that was my first question. Yeah. <laughs> that was my very first question. 49 out of the first 50 questions, I think, was, were- uh, Was, uh, yeah, you know, how so do how, do I, how do I get the money for this? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, you're, you're jumping too far yeah, forward. Yeah, let's, let's, let's walk all the way You need an idea first. You need yeah, a concept. Yeah, you need a plan. Yeah. Build it and the money will come. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, uh, we, we, as we got further down the road, you know, your financing ideas changed. You right. know, and you, you got more confidence in yourself. Yeah. So yeah, um, undercapitalization one of the number one reasons that uh, businesses don't make it. Yeah. Um, and then I always find um, entrepreneurs just sort of give up after a while. You know, they get they get fearful that the idea is not that great or the money's not coming in or. Right. You know, I always say uh, I think it's Coca Cola sold twenty six bottles the first year. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing you told me, you texted me that on launch day <laughs> is that remember Coca Cola <laughs> yeah. sold and I was like. Is this a good thing or a bad thing that he's texting me this right now? <laughs> I think they did a little better the second, third year and yeah. they're doing all right now. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. doing fine. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we all go in with great high expectations or whatever, but, you know, it, it's, there's, there's steps to it, you know? Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've experienced that in every business. No, I, very few people open up and all of a sudden it's gangbusters or whatever. It all right. start kind of, and you kind of figure it out as you're going along. Right. But, uh, it's definitely been different making the transition from how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I build a clothing brand? How do I start it up to now we're in the operation of it all. Yeah. And so that transition has been yeah. a huge, huge yeah. thing as far as like trying to figure out, yeah. you know, how, okay, now I've started a clothing line. How the hell do I run a clothing line <laughs> and where do I go from here? So yeah. it is a constant yeah. learning experience. It, it is. And, and there's a, there's a real joy to that first year or two because you don't have any operations to bother you. So you can just think. Yeah. And that's really, really important. As you start getting into operations, it becomes urgencies right. start happening and mm -hmm. timelines and, and financial things or whatever. Yeah. And you lose some of that creativity a lot of times. Yeah. You gain an experience, right. but you know, your mind's free in the beginning and take full advantage of that time because that's really, that chewing grass stage is really, really a good time. You'll never have it again. Right. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I, no, I mean, like in the sense that I've, I've thoroughly in stone, you'll never have that. Well, it'll be a few years before you do. And then, yeah. 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 I, I, I do remember that process when we were talking about the brand in, in, in those couple of years of coming up with the idea that yeah. you're like, this is the fun stage. Yeah. This is the fun part. Yeah. He's like, when you're up and running, that's, then it's business. <laughs> then it's, you've got headaches, you've yeah. got people, you've yeah. got employees, you've got, yeah. you've got a lot riding on yeah. you right now. This is yeah. the fun part. And well, and that's why a lot of people that come up with really, really good ideas, um, can only scale it to a certain level. Right. Very few Mark Zuckerberg's around where you take it from a college dorm all the way up to billions of dollars. Right. Um, so you have to find out when it, you know, is it still fun? Um, hiring people that do operations, if you don't like that part, and as you get bigger, you're able to designate. And um, I think it was the, the CEO of Sony, and they asked him what his you know, main priority was as CEO, and he goes, I'm director of morale. Because you know, he had tens of thousands of employees, yeah. and that was the thing that he felt like was the most important, because he had operations people and had all the experts. Um, so yeah, as the, as the company grows, and then there's plenty of people that get up to five, 10, 20, hundred million and go, yeah, this is not fun anymore. And they go back to that garage feeling. Yeah. And it happens all the time. You yeah. Just I just never know. I feel like time. Tyler's making that, that switch right now. Tyler from um, Outdoor Voices. Yeah. She's, um, she's hiring people, um, left and right and, um, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, you know, whether she does it or not for the rest of her life, but, uh, typically entrepreneurs have got lots of other ideas lined up, you know, and I'm at that stage where the number one thing I want to do is I want to give away, you know, it's, um, uh, in, in, in the book halftime, she talks about the first half of your life, you're looking for riches or whatever. And the second half, you're looking for enrichment. Mm -hmm. And the enrichment's a really important part. The thing I like about your generation, though, is they're starting businesses from the very beginning that have enrichment uh, already uh, uh, cooked into the, yeah. the product. Yeah. And, it's, a, uh, it's a corporate responsibility at this point. It is. To have yeah. a philanthropic aspect of your, yes. of your company. And that's something yeah. I'm working on uh, yeah. quite a bit right now. Yeah. It's just trying to yeah. figure out how Oak and Stone is going to give back. Exactly. So, and, 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 and like Bill Gates, he's really, really good at giving away. Warren Buffett goes, ah, I'm not really good at giving away. I'm going to give it to you, Bill. You give it away for me. You know? So, um, I think that's one of those big arrow pictures in the beginning. You know, we knew from the very, very beginning, we wanted to be philanthropic mm -hmm. and the rest of it was just figuring out those details, you yeah. know? Um, but so rewarding, so rewarding to do that. And I think probably going forward, I have a few more business ideas, but I would love to go around, maybe someday write a book or lecture or, you know, just help young entrepreneurs and getting that sort of corporate social responsibility yeah. and how to do it um, from what I've learned. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wake up every morning not thinking about how I'm going to sell rum, but how I'm going to give away the proceeds from selling rum, you know, right. first, the impact versus the income. 
Well, it's it's a um, it's a life of entrepreneurship yeah. that you've lived and you've understood and you fi- figured out like this is what is actually truly important. Yeah, and yeah, like, exactly. Uh, um, I think David Brooks calls it uh, eulogy virtues. You know, he says when you're 21, you've got resume virtues and you're looking at you know I'm going to be the best accountant, I'm going to be the best lawyer, I'm going to do this, this, and that. You start going to eulogies, they don't talk about how you increase sales. They talk about what kind of person you are, you know. And so I think those eulogy virtues, if I could give any recommendation to young kids, start start working on that. And uh, it will find out, um, more importantly than who um, you're going to be, find out who you want to be. Um, so if you want to be an accountant, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a politician, you want to be an entrepreneur, great. But what kind of politician do you want to be? What kind of entrepreneur do you want to be? And who are you as a person and character? Yeah. And I think it's crucial. What is the, um, for a young entrepreneur that would want to get into to business, mm-hmm. what would be the number one book you would recommend for them to start with? Oh, that's a great question. I know it's a hard question. Yeah. Because the first thing I think of is more important than the book as a person. Mm-hmm. Because the book you can read and you go, wow, this is great information. There's so many good ones. I'm reading Contagious right now. That's really good about, you know get a name out there and, and rich dad, poor dad, you know, yeah. it was perfect for you. I know yeah. personally, because we both came from guys that were the poor dad example, right? Uh, nothing wrong with being a detective or, you know, working for somebody else, but the rich dad was investing and doing other, other kinds of things. So I always recommend that to, you've got to have that in your, in your library. Um, and then of course, Tim Ferriss, and we love all the different things that are out there. Um, I'm a really big fan of, um, uh, Positively Outrageous Service. It's a, it's a book that's been out for a long time. But when I came back from the distillery down in uh, St. Martin's, one of the things I was working with them was to just give this outrageous service. Like, you know, you, these guys are coming off a cruise ship and they're walking into the distillery. Man, this is this should be fun, you know? So let's get the music cranked out. Let's hand the rum out the minute they're walking out of the bus. Let's, let's have this tour be fun. Let's have great quotes in there. Let's do all these things. And I think whether you're an actual brick and mortar place or you're an online or whatever, what do you do? What's the outrageous service that you're doing? Not just good, not even excellent, but outrageous service. Yeah. And so it's one of my favorite books. I think Southwest airlines was using as part of their training because they're known to be having fun. Yeah. Um, and I'm a big fan of uh, Jimmy Buffett. You know, I just love uh, Richard Branson guys that had this kind of laid back vibe. Yeah. Very whimsical, but are phenomenal business people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, so, I think that's kind of my style and that's why I encourage everyone. Just make sure you're having fun. What too. was the name of the book? You know, Positively Outrageous Service. Do you know who the author is? Oh. I'll look it up. Yeah. It's it also up. Positively Outrageous Marketing and stuff. It's, they, they've been out for a while, but it was one of the things that just helped me in the, in the very beginning sort of get that balance. And I think it's one of the reasons that uh, you can go 25 or 30 years into business and not burn out. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm looking for more opportunities or whatever because I, I have got the balance of fun and business. And you know, what's more fun than going to St. Martin's and drinking rum, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, being a business person or whatever. Right. And uh, I, I just think personally, it's, 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 it's my, my secret yeah. to doing it, you know, because it is a marathon in so many ways. But if it's a marathon with rum stops, yeah. you know, or Gatorade stops or whatever, you know, it's, it's just a little bit more fun of a, a marathon. Um, but uh, I, I would think that would be the, the biggest thing. But yeah, balance the books. There's so many good ones out there but always balance it with somebody who has practical experience yeah. because uh, I find a lot of uh, people that come to me are loaded with theories, you know? And uh, I had a friend of mine who's a psychologist and he said, uh, yeah, you know, before I had children, I had three theories. He said, um, you know, on how to raise kids and everything. He says, now I have three children, no theories. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. And the idea is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's good to have that basis to work off of, but um, hands-on experience. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the, the last question, cause we got to wrap up. Um, I ask a lot of times, you know, if there was a way for you to get one message out to the world, mm. you know, talk about your, your eulogy, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. message, you know, the yeah. last thing that you would want people to hear, yeah. uh, from you, uh, what would that be? Give back, give back, give back, give pay back. forward. Give yeah. Back. Yeah. I was just having a great conversation, um, with another business person and we were talking about her upbringing or whatever. And he had a dad that wasn't the most attentive dad or whatever, but he became an incredible dad, you know, to his, his children. And we were talking about the, um, I think Socrates has talked about it. Lincoln has talked about it, whatever he says, if you have a hole in your heart, give that hole away to somebody else. You know, if you didn't get the love you wanted or whatever is, is, is a son, make sure you give it. It's the greatest way to fill that hole. And we all walk around with these, um, these gaping holes in our um, psyche and it's just giving back, giving it away. And, uh, 
I think it's the, it's the secret. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, Scott, thank yeah. you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure yeah. as always. And uh, I'm excited for C-Spout Rum. That's my, uh, that's my favorite new uh, company that's going to be coming out this year. So <laughs> thanks for the plug. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Ricardo. Always right. enjoy it. Thank you. Yep. <laughs>